in December. Okay. And so the court was inclined to admit them. solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of law the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, or nothing but the truth. I so affirm. Thank you. Have a seat. Doctor, tell the jury where you work. I currently work at the Midwest Medical Examiner's Office in Anoka County, Minnesota. And how long have you worked there? Five years. Where did you work before you were in Minnesota? I was at the Office of the Medical Investigator at the University of New Mexico. Doctor, tell us a little bit about your background, your training and experience. Absolutely. So a forensic pathologist, which is what I do, is a physician. So to become a physician, you do your undergraduate work. So I completed that at Rome College. I then went on to get my medical degree at the University of Medicine and Dentistry, in New Jersey, New Jersey Medical School, now luckily Rutgers. Uh, and then I went on to do my pathology residency at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. So what does that mean? So uh, when you do a pathology residency, you do a couple different things. So I did anatomic pathology and clinical pathology. And anatomic pathology is a study of the body, disease in the body. 
So if you've ever been to a hospital and they've taken a little biopsy, they're going to send it to a pathologist and they'll render a diagnosis. So that includes parts of you and then also the full you. Clinical pathology, which is also part of my training, is a study of disease in body fluids. So if you ever went to the doctor and they took blood and they sent it off and they came back and they said, this is what your blood sugar is, etc., that's also done by a pathologist. So after completing those two uh, residencies, I then went on to do a fellowship here in Albuquerque at the Office of the Medical Investigator, and that's a one-year fellowship where we really study both the cause and the manner of death on utilizing autopsy, and also multiple different uh, modalities. So my residency really set me up for that. After completing those three things, I did sit for my board, so I'm triple board certified, uh, and then I began my work at the uh, Midwest Medical Examiners in Minnesota. Are you still doing autopsies there? Yes. How many autopsies have you done in your time? Uh, over 1,500. Have you been qualified as an expert before? Yes. How many times? Greater than 15. And, Your Honor, at this point we would move um, to qualify Dr. Ash Kendrick as an expert in forensic pathology. No objection. She'll be permitted to testify in that capacity. Doctor, you stated that you were you did your one-year fellowship here in New Mexico at the Office of the Medical Examiner at University of New Mexico. Was that around, were you doing that in August of 2016? Yes, it was. And back then, did the Medical Examiner's Office here receive the, the body of Victoria Martins? Yes, they did. What date were, uh, or dates was that autopsy completed? August 25th and 26th. Is it typical for autopsies to take two days? Uh, in a complex case, yes. What about a regular? No, a regular right. case would be one to three hours. What was your role in performing the autopsy? So I was the fellow on the case, and the way it works in fellowship is that you are the primary physician. So you've already been training for several years on how to do it. Um, so you know how, but then you also have an attending supervisor. So I was the primary physician on this case. Who was your attending? Matthew Kane. And was he there with you from beginning to end? Yes. Did you prepare a report for this case? Yes. Is there more than one report in this case? Yes. Why is that? There was an amended report uh, in March of 2017. Uh, it changed some of the wording, it did not affect the manner or cause of death. In this case, did you actually go to the scene of Victoria's homicide? Yes, I did. Why did you go to the scene? So part of your training is to understand the process from beginning to end, and the beginning really begins with the death of another. So when our office is notified as a fellow, you have the opportunity to do both scenes and understand what the death investigators do for you so that you can help them later. Uh, it's a very important part of our job. So I went along with Bill Dees to see him work. And what was his role? He was the death investigator for our office. When you arrived on scene, um, tell us a little bit about how you interact with law enforcement and what precautions you take inside that scene. Sure, so part of what we do is we work uh, alongside of law enforcement. So they want to make sure everything's safe and ready to go, so we talk, talk with them, and then when they felt it was appropriate to enter the facility or the apartment in this case, um, we went along, and I walked as an observer, so I followed um, Mr. Dees through this. Uh, things that we always do is I was in scrubs, so I wasn't wearing my personal clothes. Um, you wear booties to make sure that you're not tracking things around. Um, I wore gloves. Uh, and you're not allowed to touch anything. Did you view the entire apartment? Yes. And was uh, Mr. Dees taking photographs? Yes. Is that standard practice yes. for you to take your own photographs? Yes, very helpful. While you were on scene, did you have an opinion about the amount of blood that you saw? Yes, I did. What was that opinion? There was not much blood for the amount of injury that I was seeing. Just moving to a few other things in the scene, did you see the uh, orange plastic laundry hamper? Yes. Did you view the washing machine? Yes. What was inside the washing machine? Uh, there were blankets and kind of fabric material within it. Did you notice if they were wet or dry? They were wet at the time. Did you view some knives there? Yes. Did you look inside the kitchen sink? Yes, I did. What did you notice about that water? There was still liquid in there, and it had um, kind of a fatty material in it. So if you cook, and you ever kind of cook off chicken, that kind of like chicken fat. 
in your opinion, could that have come from uh, Victoria? Absolutely. And did you notice the garbage bags that ended up containing her arms and organs? Yes, I did. Where were those? Those were in the bottom of the laundry basket underneath the purse. Is part of the uh, job there on site to do an on site assessment of your patient? Yes, I did. And tell us what you did with regards to that. So it was, a, you try to handle things as minimally as possible, but you also want to make sure that you're bringing appropriate evidence and aren't missing anything. So since I was the doctor who'd be doing the exam the next day, uh, things I looked at were, were the tub, um, fabric around her. There was some fabric that was on the body that we then placed in the paint can. And we do that in an effort to maintain um, accelerant. So if there's ever a fire, one of the things that we have to be thinking about is what caused the fire and what may have been on these, these fragments. You put it in a paint can, it doesn't all dissipate into the air. So I, I helped retrieve that and put it in a paint can. Um, and then I also looked at, after we had her placed in the body bag, at her eyes, because we were wondering, obviously there were a lot of injuries, but you don't want to go in and just have a tiny little view. You really want to stay open-minded and think, what are other things that we could be looking for? And so one of the things that we looked in her eyes for was petechial hemorrhages, and she had florid petechial hemorrhages in both eyes. So it makes you continue to think this may not just be a knife I'm looking for, but there may be other things uh, that I should be assessing in the scene. On scene, um, describe the process of putting her body into the body bag. Uh, so, uh, so I don't, I don't remember who the transport person was. So we um, employ a transport group. They actually drive the body bag from one place to another, um, but. Uh, uh, Victoria's body was brought from the bathroom into, uh, placed in the body bag, the body bag was moved into the living room, and that's actually where I did my assessment of her eyes, because in the bathtub she was uh, over on her side and kind of hunk, hunk her down, I guess, or kind of rolled down, um, so I couldn't get a good visualization there. So I did more of an assessment at that point, and that's, uh, that was the movement. And what about the bag that was located containing her arms. Tell us about that. So obviously, looking at her, we were missing parts. We found the bag, and the question was, do we have everything? Do we need to keep looking? And so um, part of my role was to palpate the bag and make sure I felt everything that we thought we could be missing. And so that was, uh, those were present in the bag. Was that bag opened there on the scene? No, it was not. How was that bag transported? Uh, it was transported in a separate body bag. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Doctor, I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification of states 372 all the way through 398. If you can take a look at these and tell me if you recognize them. Are these all photos that were taken um, by the Office of the Medical Examiner either at the scene or during the autopsy of Victoria Martins? Yes, they are. Do they accurately represent everything you've described, in, including her autopsy? Yes. Your Honor, the state would move for admission states 372 through 398. No objection. 372 through 398 will be admitted, and you may publish. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to just put up here on the screen 372. Is this the basket that you located the arms and organs in the yes. bottom of? Yes. And I'm going to publish 373. You described putting her into, sort of moving her out of the tub. Is this what you were describing? Yes. Is this where you did your assessment of her right yes. here? Walk us through, Doctor, what happens just generally when a body is received by the medical investigator's office. Absolutely. So when a body is received uh, in the facility, it is documented where who's bringing it, what time it arrived, um, and then it'll be placed in a cooler. Uh, the way it works at the medical investigators every morning, there's a doctor's meeting. So that gives us an opportunity to sit down, review the case, review the photographs, any additional information that may have come in. 
In the morning, they also do a CT scan, so a CAT scan. So if you've ever had one of those, big machine, makes a lot of noise, but it gives us a very nice image of the things I can't see just from the outside. So that gets performed. That's also something that we review together at our morning meeting. After the morning meeting is uh, completed, we assign the cases as appropriate. So it's convention that if you went to the scene, that, that would be your case, because it's just kind of continuity, so you understand the whole scene. Uh, we also get an, uh, an opportunity as the text go back to re-review everything, make sure we're comfortable, kind of have a plan. Now when we go back, we're going to take photographs of any, uh, both, both as the body is received. We're going to document things, um, is the body bag sealed, uh, who's there, and then we're going to take the opportunity to save things as evidence. So some of the things that you can save as evidence is swaths for DNA. You can save clothing. I mentioned before that you can save fabric, uh, look for accelerants. Uh, you can take fingernail clippings, so it's important to clip the fingernails. Uh, you can also take toenail clippings. You can take hair for a DNA standard, and you can also take blood. So there's a whole series of different things that you can take um, for evidence. And it's important to do that before you do any washing and before there's major manipulation, simply because the more you manipula manipulate, the more you, leave, you the more you change things. So we take our evidence as needed. Then we're going to go forward and actually remove the clothing, wash the body, and start to really look at the body in different ways. Do I see injuries? Do I see evidence of natural disease? How much does the body weigh? Uh, what's present? What isn't? So it's just really an opportunity to step back and look at everything, uh, both in a broad light and then also take closer pictures. So as you can imagine, depending on how complex the injuries and the disease are, it can take a very short period of time or it can take a very long period. After the external is completed, we're then going to move to the internal examination. An internal examination is an opportunity for me to both look at the <coughs> disease processes, but also to look at injury. So is it injury just on the outside? Is it injury on the inside? Uh, what else am I seeing? Does it, um, is anything missing? So, and if it's missing, where is it? So we really try and look at everything very broadly and then become more focused as needed. After that's completed, so we've done our evidence, we've done our external, we've done our internal, we've taken our imaging, it's the waiting game. So we have to take tissue and our blood for toxicology as well. So uh, our best choice is blood. Then we have to move on to different tissues because if there's no blood, we still want to assess kind of what is present and what isn't. Then we have to wait. Um, and then we also decide, are there additional studies? So I've said I need toxicology. Do I need DNA analysis? We have odontologists, forensic odontologists, who specialize in the dental work of the deceased. We also have forensic anthropologists, so they work on the bony structure of the deceased. So just looking at the bones, can they give us information? Sometimes it's age, sometimes it's injury, sometimes it's disease. So we have multiple tools that we can uh, utilize, and often we try to be as thorough as we can and utilize those specialists um, when we can. Then once I have all that information, we're going to sit down, we're going to look at what does this mean? What, what am I seeing? How does this make sense? And I'm going to come up with a cause and a manner of death. So cause and manner, although they kind of go together, are not exactly the same thing. Manner of death is the circumstances around the death. My choices are uh, natural, homicide, undetermined, suicide, and accident. So I have to pick one of those five. What circumstances around the death fit the best. Then I have to look at cause. So cause of death is really, why are you dead? So did you have a heart attack? Did you drown? Did you get into a car accident and get blunt force injuries? Um, if you have a gunshot wound, is that what killed you? So I need to know cause, and then with the cause, I also look at the manner, and that's what we come up with together. Or, I mean, with my attending physician in this particular case. So we come up with cause and manner. We're gonna make a report um, and then that report will be available. In this particular case, you said that um, a CT scan is done generally, with, and one was done here? Correct. Were there any findings in that CT scan right off the bat that were of interest? So one of the things I couldn't see, um, there was a fracture of the, the humerus, of the left arm, uh, that I couldn't see from the outside. There was no bruising on the outside, but that, that was fractured. Um, and obviously, many of the things that I had seen before with the uh, amputation of the arms and the partial amputation of the leg, uh, the absence of the heart and partial of the liver were also noted. And you mentioned um, collecting all that physical evidence. In this case, did you opt? We heard from um, the uh, morphology tech 
uh, Mr. Jarvis a few days ago, um, and he talked about taking, there's a traditional set of swabs you can take or you can opt for more. In this case, did you opt for additional swabbing? Yes, we did. And why was that decision made? So we want to get as much information as we can. And since we didn't know exactly what happened and there were multiple types of injuries, we wanted to be as thorough as possible. So any place we could possibly get DNA from, we wanted to try and extract that. And you mentioned doing all of that before you clean the body. Why would you clean off your patient? So I need to look. So if there's dirt, if there's blood, if there's tissue, I'm looking at that. I'm not seeing the skin underlying it. So I need to make sure that everything is clean so I am actually understanding what I'm seeing. During Victoria's autopsy, who all was present? Um, you've already talked about you and Dr. Kane, and we know about uh, Mr. Jarvis. Who else was there? So we have uh, photo technologists. Uh, so they, their entire job is to take photographs of tissues and bodies. So we had, uh, I believe, I, can I refresh my memory? Please. Mr. Daniel Ward. We also have somebody who does the CTs. Uh, I believe that was Darla Benson at the time, but we had Darla Benson, Ryan Castillo, uh, Michael Jarvis. Those were my technicians. As I mentioned, the photo tech, Daniel Ward. And then we also had four law enforcement officers. At the OMI, they're not allowed down into the autopsy suite, but they actually are kind of up above um, watching down. We can talk to them if necessary. And there were four uh, that we had noted there. Andrew, uh, Let's see, Andrew Sue, Detective Jones, Detective Lau, and Detective Akata. You talked a little bit about, um, so in this case we have sort of two things. We have Victoria's body and then we have this bag, and you talked about collecting this bag. I'm going to publish what's been admitted as States 374. You can just tell the jury what this is and why you do this before we... Uh, so I mentioned when a body comes in, we want to document uh, who's bringing the body in, is it tagged, so it hasn't been sealed, and this is our way of saying the date that the body was, uh, the date of death and date of receipt, so DOR's date of receipt, um, came into our facility on the 24th, and then shows that the body was appropriately tagged. I'm going to publish what's been marked as dates 378. Do you recognize that item? Yes. Is that, what is that? Uh, that is the bag that the arms and organs were received. Who opened this bag? Uh, I believe it was myself with Dr. Kane nearby. And I'm going to publish 379. So, so this is a bag within a bag, so we opened up the outer bag uh, and then noticed another bag, so we tried to take a picture again. I'm going to publish 380. Can you walk us through what we see inside this bag? Absolutely. So here you can see the dismembered arms. Uh, both the right and the left, there's some paper towel tissue. Uh, at the bottom of the picture, you can see the liver, so it's kind of glistening right there. This one? Uh -huh. Correct. And then in the crook of the right arm, so right in your elbow, there's some tissue that is the posterior aspect of the heart. We also see an, an amount of blood here. You talked about a lack of blood on the scene. Does the amount that was located in this bag um, make up for what you think was not at the scene? No, it does not. When was that bag examined, like during the autopsy? So it was, uh, so it's part of the external examination. So when we open up the body bag of Victoria, we see her body, we take a look, and then we're going to be opening up that to make sure we have everything accounted for. Because the sooner we know what we're missing, the sooner we can try and, and make sure we have everything. I know you said, Doctor, that you do the external exam and then you move to the internal, um, but instead of splitting those up, um, let's just walk through Victoria's body from head to toe. So starting with her head and neck, and let me, well, let me actually show you 375. 
Is this the condition that Victoria was in yes. when you began this autopsy? 376, what is this? This is the lower half. And 377? Uh, this is the posterior of the lower extremities. So this is before she's cleaned off? Correct. I'm going to publish 381. If you can walk us through what you're seeing here. Sure. I'm not sure if there's as much kind of light glare, but uh, what we do is we take a picture of the neck. Obviously, the neck is very important, so we want to get good pictures of it. Um, so, kind of hard. So, kind of where the white glare is on my photograph. So, there's abrasions on the left side of the neck. Uh, so, kind of red. There also with some bruise. Uh, so, that's scratches and bruises always concerning, uh, left, left and right sided, uh, and then also kind of you scan out a little bit on her jaw, on the left side of the jaw, there are some contusions, correct, right there, that are oval in shape, so they're definitely much longer, um, that are on her face as well. Were those bruises notable based on their shape? They were. So one of the things that we really try to understand to get more information is what could have caused these injuries. So is it a, you know, are you looking at gun, are you looking at hands, are you looking at a hammer? So these are a pattern that are consistent with, but not only uh, a hand. I'm going to show you 383, and if you need me to bring you the actual exhibit, if the sure. glare is not working. Does this photo, and I'm going to, I'm going to actually bring it over to you because I think there is a little glare. Does States 383 depict maybe a little better the bruising that you were describing? Yes, yes, yes much better. Um, so it's a bruise that starts, so you understand from the corner of the lip and it goes down to this part of the jaw, kind of from the mid cheek here down and here down. On her left side, sorry, uh, doing the reverse. But on the left side, there's kind of three, they're finger shaped. Um, again, I cannot uh, exclude other things, but they are consistent with a hand. A hand? Uh, or a hand fingers. So, so would that be consistent with potentially a hand over her mouth? Yes. So additional injuries that we saw uh, included an abrasion. So one of, we always look at the inside as much as we can. So we're looking at the inside of her lips. Uh, there's an abrasion on the inner lip that overlies one of her great teeth, and that's consistent with something pressing on the face. Um, it's not uh, usually a blunt injury. We tend to see it more in uh, an asphyxial injury. So somebody putting pressure down, maybe moving a little bit, but not, um, not a punch. So that's what we see right here. And, uh, as you can tell, it kind of overlies one of the teeth. Um, so that's going to be consistent with her asphyxial injury. So I have the injury to the neck, um, both anterior and posterior. I have the injuries of the jaw. I have the injuries of the upper lips. Um, I mentioned the petechial hemorrhages. Uh, we have multiple of those. So petechial hemorrhage, what does that mean? So you can get them whenever blood goes out, but it can't get back in. So your arteries pump really hard. Your veins are soft and squishy. So as you can see, these, these little red punctate dots, that's telling me that something obstructed the blood flow. Blood her heart was still pumping, but it couldn't get back in. So it goes path of least resistant, and it also causes these little hemorrhages. So she had these um, both on her cheeks. You can kind of see them faintly, kind of towards the bridge of her nose and over her cheeks. And you can see them on the conjunctiva. You can also see them on her eyelids as well. So for the record, this is 393, showing the hemorrhages in her eye. And before that was 394, and that's depicting your description of the pressure um, tooth injury on the inside of her mouth? Correct. So we uh, have the ability to also look underneath the scalp. So bruises don't always come to the surface. Um, they can be deeper down. So if you've ever gotten a bruise that looks really tiny and then over time it kind of spreads, that, that's what I'm talking about. So we reflect the scalp um, and we look at, there's a tissue over the skull and then there's also a tissue underneath the scalp. And there was bruising there. So she had a little on the left posterior side and also on the front of the scalp. So that that's consistent with a blunt injury. That's not an asphyxial injury. So something impacted those. It's a more diffuse look to it. And again, there wasn't a contusion on the outside, so we were able to see that interiorly. These are not enough to cause uh, concussion or knockout. They're just a some you hit your head. Talking about the inside, we talked a little bit about her neck. And I'm going to po or publish 384. 
followed by 382, which are the right and left of her neck. Um, underneath her skin, were you able to see injuries to her muscles? Yes, so we do an exam. As I mentioned, we look underneath the scalp. We also look underneath the neck skin. So you have muscles that start um, up right at the top and they go down to your, your clavicle. Um, and we're able to reflect back to skin. We can look at each muscle specifically, both the front and the back. And she had hemorrhage in multiple of her anterior neck muscles. She also had injury to the posterior of her throat. So you have muscles that help you talk. Um, and it was, it's her posterior cricothyroid, which is just a fancy name for the muscles on the back of your throat. She had hemorrhage there. She also had hemorrhage um, uh, on her erector spinae, so kind of on her back as well. So she had hemorrhage both in her anterior neck muscles and uh, posteriorly as well. That hemorrhage in the back near the spinal cord, is that something that's consistent with manual strangulation? Yes. And then tell us about her brain. What did you see with her brain? So her brain uh, did not have any bleeding over it. So her blunt injury to her head that I mentioned didn't cause a brain bleed. It wasn't subdural hematoma. But we look at tissue later. So one of the things we can do at exam is we can take a little bit of tissue and say, hey, what happened? And what we saw there was called hypoxic ischemic change, which just means hypoxic, no oxygen, and no blood flow with it. So I have evidence that there was not enough oxygen or blood going to her brain for a period of time. Doctor, I think you covered them all, but is that kind of an, a good assessment of all the injuries from the head down to the neck? I believe so. So moving to her arms, I'm going to publish what's been marked or admitted, I'm sorry, as 385. Uh, you described a little bit about the removal of these arms. Uh, were you able to determine what type of instrument removed these arms? So I know it's sharp. It's a sharp force injury. So. Uh, I can't tell you exactly the length of something or exactly what the blade looked like, but I do know that this was most likely a knife. Um, and you can see that there are multiple, so this is the left anterior shoulder. This wasn't just one quick little slice, this was multiple attempts to move the skin um, and to cut the skin. So it, I, you can see that there's kind of a V-shape, so it looks like at the top you have some something cutting there and going down and then maybe moving more laterally. Um, so there's multiple sharp force injuries there. I'm not sure if we have a picture of it, but on the end um, of the shoulder, of the bony portion, there's also, I believe on this, I'm not sure if the picture is the easiest to understand, but there are also sharp force injuries of the head um, there. So of the bone there. So I have evidence of multiple sharp force injuries. Here. You're talking about two her actual to the bone, yeah. This, I don't know which bone that is, but yeah. um, her shoulder. Mm -hmm. Okay. You mentioned that you saw, and let me back up actually and ask you. You've described kind of multiple cuts. I see this instrument here. Um, it looks like it's kind of clipped here. Um, why was this done? So we need to understand how the body goes back together. One of our jobs is when somebody comes in multiple pieces, let's, you have to make sure you have everything and how do things line up? Because sometimes in the tissue that is separated, you have information. So we try to figure out what's there. And I see, it looks like a number of kind of smaller sharp force injuries here. Is that what you were describing about sort of? Kind of the, either the, a starting motion. We often see these uh, in, Either hesitation is one of the terms that's used a lot, or like a trial. So you're trying to figure out how much pressure it takes to get through the skin. So you'll see multiple um, sharp force injury kind of in a line in the same area. You mentioned that there was a CT scan with an injury you weren't able to see. This is 396. Is this that injury? Yes. To her left arm? Correct, left arm. And so what type of fracture are we seeing in this left arm? So this is a butterfly fracture is what it's described, and it's caused by kind of a, a a motion that involves a bend and a turn. So, uh, yeah, there's a bend and a turn. Uh, are you able to determine if this injury happened before or after she died? Uh, this is a post-mortem injury. So why do I say that? I say that because we're looking at the bone and we're looking at the muscle. This is a very vascular area, and I don't see any blood. I see no hemorrhage. There was no response to the body. So this was post-mortem. Moving to states... 387. Can you describe what this is? 
This is the right arm. And 388. The left arm. And 389. The left hand. So looking at her hand, her skin looks wrinkly like she's been in water, like you would see when you take a hot bath. Can you describe how this happens? So this happens, um, as you mentioned, we call it pruny in my family, but you get into the water for a few period of time and your skin kind of makes that puckering. Uh, this was likely due to the hands being in the bag with the blood. So it's con it condenses um, and it's called maceration. Going back to her arms, did you notice injuries on her arms? So she had obviously the amputation injuries and the sharp force injuries, as I mentioned, uh, kind of at the top of her arm. She had a couple scratches, uh, bruises, I believe, on her left posterior elbow. Um, uh, those were the main injuries besides the fracture. On her right arm, was there also a bruise at her elbow? Uh, may I refresh my yes. memory? Yes, please. And maybe I have, maybe it was the left. There was, a, on the right elbow, there was a red contusion and a purple contusion. Would that be consistent with a grab to that elbow? Yes. And do you have an opinion, going back to 396, this fracture in her arm as to the amount of force that the, this would take? I do not. Did she have abrasions on her hands or fingers? Uh, small, nothing, no large. Do you feel like we've summarized uh, the injuries to her arms adequately, doctor? I believe so. Moving to her chest and abdomen, let me... Let me show you what's been admitted as 386. Can you tell us what we're seeing here? So this is after we cleaned, we removed the clothing, we removed um, the plastic bag that was around her, and then cleaned her up as well. So again, this is an opportunity for me to look at injuries and try and understand what we're seeing. So we discussed the amputation of the upper extremities earlier, and then here, uh, I guess the two other things we haven't seen so far are going to be the, the big incision that goes above the nipples and down to the pubic region, sorry, uh, as well as the partial amputation of the left hip. Do you have an opinion here as to how her bowels kind of came out of her body? Uh, so when you open up your body, it is no longer a closed sac. I don't know how it came out. They were, in the pictures from the scene, you can actually see that they were covered in the plastic bag. So they were out on scene. Could it have been from moving or somebody grabbing them? I, I don't know. I'm going to publish 397. Can you tell us what's going on with this photo? Yeah. So. The picture can be distracting when there's lots of things behind it. So one of the things we try to do is get a good picture of each injury. And so here we used, a, it's called a blue chop, and we just placed it posterior to the wound so that we could really understand the different pieces um, and then also try and reapproximate it. As I mentioned before, and you saw, we try to figure out where all the tissue goes and uh, what, what we need to see. Can you tell us what was removed from her body? So her heart was absent, as well as the left lobe of her liver. Was there some, I'm seeing kind of this whole, was there some bony or sternum or? Oh, yes, sorry. The sternum also was received in the bag. Uh, so your ribs go together, there's a bone right in the center, I'm keep hitting this, I apologize. There's a bone right in the center that all of your ribs connect to. So that had been removed and also placed in the bag. Let's talk about these cuts that I'm seeing around, oops, around kind of yeah. this larger cut. Yeah, so these are similar to the ones we saw on the shoulder. So when you're trying to uh, make an incision, you don't always know the pressure. And as you use a knife more, depending on how sharp or how dull it is, you may need more or less pressure. So these are consistent with uh, a sharp force injury to the chest. It appears to be uh, parallel to the successful incised wound, so likely either hesitation, trial, or, or attempts to enter the body cavities. Can you tell if all of this um, cutting and removal of her organs and sternum was before or after she died? 
So post-mortem, so I mentioned before that we can look at histology. So I looked at a part of her brain, um, I looked at several different tissues, but we also looked at the tissue here. And this had no inflammation. So your body, when it gets upset, the first thing it's gonna do is start sending out inflammation, neutrophils, lymphocytes, and we can actually look at those, um, and that was not there. So this would be consistent with a post-mortem injury. You mentioned that her, well, let me move to 395 before we move on. Were any of her ribs injured? So there was a, a injury to, or sharp force injury to ribs three through eight on the left and on the right. So that would, that's how you would remove the sternum. You mentioned her heart was removed. Were there injuries? Was that removed? Well, let me back up. Was that removed in one piece? Yeah, the heart was removed in one piece, yes. Can you describe for the jury how your heart is connected inside your body? Absolutely. So you have kind of three places where blood needs to go. You need blood to go from your heart into your lungs. You need it to come back from your lungs with oxygen. And then it needs to go out to your body and get everything there. So you have your uh, vena cave inferior, in, sorry, superior and inferior vena cava. That goes into the right side. Um, so those two different veins have to be uh, severed. Then they go into your right ventricle and go up through your pulmonary artery up to your lungs. That has to be severed as well. Then when it comes back in, they come into the left atria. So there's actually four vessels that come into your left atria. So all four of those have to be severed. Then you go into the left ventricle and your left ventricle is a big beefy one that pushes it out through your aorta to the rest of your body. And so the aorta also has to be uh, separate for removal. In looking at what was done to Victoria, do you have an opinion on what was cut or can you tell us what was cut to get her heart out the way it came out? So the sternum would have been removed most likely because you need access. If you're gonna get your hand in there, you, have, you make, need to make a hole to go in to get out. Um, so all of those would have been severed for removal. Uh, you talked about some connections at the top of her heart. Could those have been cut incidentally to when her sternum was cut? Uh, so she had an injury posterior to the heart, so your aorta goes up and then it comes back down. And that's the part that actually gives blood everywhere. And that's behind your heart. And so there was an incised wound to the aorta anteriorly. So that could have been done uh, during the removal of the heart um, very easily. Was there some defects inside her body, aside from what was taken out to her aorta? Uh, just that one wound anteriorly, and then there were three defects to the heart as well. Do you have an opinion on whether or not this would be a deliberate act, removing this heart? Yes. There were some, I'm gonna publish 390. Is this Victoria's heart? Yes. Were some injuries, some sharp force injuries uh, found on her heart? Yes. I'm gonna show you 391. Can you tell us about 391? This is the liver, so there were all Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that is not what I meant to show. Tell us about the injuries to her heart, not her liver. Sure. So um, there are sharp force injuries. If you look, if we cut this in half, and you look on your right side, um, kind of at the bottom, there's a sharp force defect that goes into uh, the heart that you can see here. This is the front of the heart. Tell me where that is. Over here? Uh, go down a little bit. Now go to your right. Uh, other way, sorry. It's okay. Right here? Right there. Okay. So that's a sharp force injury Correct. made by something? Uh, likely a knife. How many other injuries were there? So there were two others, uh, and they were considered on the posterior part of the heart. So your heart doesn't stay perfectly round when it's not full of blood and pumping. Um, so you actually can see part of the posterior here, but the anterior has this, and then the posterior had two defects. Could any of these defects have been incidental to any stab, stabbing motions through yes. that sternum? Now let's move to her liver, I apologize, 392. Tell us how, you said just the left lobe of liver was removed? Right. I'm gonna publish, let me do 391 first. Tell us about where that is and what part the left lobe is. Absolutely, so your liver lives on the right side of your body. Most of it kind of tucks up underneath your rib cage um, and is protected somewhat. But part of it kind of comes across uh, the middle. So depending on how large your liver is, more or less of it may come to the middle. So the left lobe of the liver is kind of a thinner portion. Um, it's kind of like an apron. You guys can actually palpate your livers. 
Um, but if you were going to cause an incision, and in children your liver is a little bit bigger, uh, you would easily come to the liver. So it would be underneath where the incision was. And this was also the removal of this uh, appeared intentional to you? Yes. And there are some, I'm seeing this kind of, it looks like a cut to me on 391. What is that? That's an incised wound. And 392? More incised wounds. This is the front of the liver. Could those injuries also have been through her body? Yes. Let's talk about her leg, or her legs, I guess. You said there was an attempted amputation. I'm going to publish 398. Does this depict that? Yes, it does. And I also see some what look like burns here. Can you tell us how severe any burns were to her? Sure. These were very superficial burns. So you can have different layers of your skin get burned. Um, this didn't go through the top layer. It didn't get into any fatty tissue or uh, any muscle. So this would be considered a superficial burn. Tell us about this attempted amputation and what was done here. Sure. So your hip is not like your shoulder. So uh, if you are deboning something, so for example, spatch talking a chicken, you need to take the pieces apart. There are going to be some bones that are easier to get between. So if you remove the leg of a chicken, um, you can actually go right in the bone. People, that's how your shoulders are. Your hips are actually a ball and socket. So your hip has a, a femoral head, and it also has a cup that it sits on top of and around. And that's how your hip can move in so many different directions. And it also helps you walk because you can put weight on it. So if you're trying to cut through there, you can't because you're going to come to that femoral neck, and you're not going to be able to just get into that castle joint. Whereas in your shoulder, you can just get right between these things. So this incision here uh, went through and attempted, if you're kind of palpating it, you can feel kind of a skinny part to get there, um, and then was unsuccessful. Tell us, uh, you mentioned this, and I think you told us a little bit about what anthropology is. Was that ordered in this case? It was. So how does that work? What happens? So after we have completed our examination, there are, uh, there are a few wonderful people who are able to really examine the bones closely. So we work with uh, Dr. Wendy McQuaid, who is based in Texas. Um, she is able to review the bones and kind of try to tell us more, possibly. Not always, but sometimes they can tell you, is it blunt, is it sharp, maybe what kind of tool was used. So we utilize this in this particular situation in an attempt to gather more information. Did your consult with Dr. McQuaid um, change any of your initial opinions about what happened? It did not. Did it give you any sort of new or better information aside from what you already knew? No. Was toxicology ordered on Victoria? Yes. And tell us about what type of toxicology you normally order. Sure. So in most cases of homicide, we do a basic uh, exam. Uh, we can also do an expanded as needed. So what, what's the difference? So basic looks at um, alcohol, and then your basic drugs of abuse will be meth uh, methanol, uh, sorry, ethanol, apologize, methamphetamine, um, any of your opiates, so kind of the common things that you think of that may uh, alter your uh, body's function. An expanded panel is going to look at even more things. So it'll look for fentanyl. Um, it can look for some prescription medications. Uh, we can also look for carbon monoxide. So in this case, that was important because anybody who's ever uh, exposed to fire, we try to see if there's carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a product of combustion. If you are around it, it sticks to your red cells. It does not come off easily. So if you are inhaling and exhaling, uh, you will get an elevated level of carbon monoxide. So those are the different, some of the different things that we can look at. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, we were not able to get sufficient amount of blood to send off for toxicology. So all you need is four mils. Um, it's not very much. Uh, it's, you know, that is less than what you can carry on to an airplane. So small amounts. We couldn't even get that much. I'm thinking about when, when there's little test tubes when you have a blood draw. How many? Correct. How one. much is four mils? One. I need one of those to do toxicology, and we were not able to get enough blood to do that. In that case, how did you proceed? So we can look at tissue. So in this particular situation, we chose to use liver tissue. 
um, and send that. That's a common uh, tissue to use. And what did that liver test uh, tell you? Do my thyroid first? Please. Refer to my report real quick. So uh, when we first looked, we looked at carbon monoxide. It's, uh, you get carbon monoxide, you get our <laughs> iron, and you also get carboxyhemoglobin. So it's not as easy to look at. But we showed that it was not elevated. So it was a normal level um, somebody walking around uh, would have. And we also saw ethanol in liver tissue at 210 grams. Uh, sorry, 210 milligrams per 100 grams. So that can be seen uh, either in exposure or it can also be seen as uh, post-mortem generation. So your liver is really, really biologically active and it has sugars in there and one of the things it can do is it can make uh, ethanol. It can make ethanol. So let me just unpack that a little bit. You were talking about the carbon monoxide and that was not elevated. What does that tell us about this fire and the injuries to our legs? So this was postmortem. The fire was after death. And you talked about the liver test with an ethanol. Is ethanol normally um, found when someone's been drinking alcohol? Yes. So in this test, she did have that finding, but it's you've attributed it to liver activity Correct. after she was dead. Right. So, so one of the things that we did do is we also sent off the trace fluid. So if we ever get a result and we need to figure out what does that mean, we can do additional testing. So the additional testing we did was we took vitreous fluid and we tested that for ethanol and that was not there. So this is more consistent with post-mortem regeneration. What generation? Where does vitreous fluid come from? That's the fluid in your eye. So you have a clear fluid. We can also test for your electrolytes. So I mentioned before when you take blood and it goes off to uh, the lab and you get results back, those are your electrolytes. So post-mortem, unfortunately, uh, looking at blood does not work because again, things keep moving and keep in generating things but your eye is a protected space. So it stops in that moment, um, and it's very good for several hours afterwards. So we looked at vit her vitreous electrolytes, which were normal, that tells me there was no dehydration, and she's not a diabetic. Um, so that's the information we get there, and then also there was no alcohol present in her eye. Were there any other drugs that were looked for and found or not found? So we do look at an expanded panel, so it is a very long, long list of drugs that they look for. Uh, when we sent off an expanded on the, the muscle tissue, we found caffeine, and then theobromine, which is a breakdown product of caffeine, so it's in your body if you drink caffeine. Anything? Nothing out of, no, out of the Doctor, do you have an opinion on how long, we've, we've gone through a number of injuries, um, they're extensive, do you have an opinion on how long this dismemberment and the midline cut and the removal of her organs and the attempted uh, taking off of her leg might have taken? It would depend on your skill level. And do you have an opinion as to, I think you've said it on some of them, but just so for clarity's sake, did all of those injuries, um, and by all of those injuries I mean the cutting and the removal of organs, were those all post-mortem or after-death injuries? Yes. And she did have some other, you've described some smaller scratching and things, um, what's your, especially on her neck, do you have an opinion on the timing of those injuries uh, to her death? Those were pre so those were before death. Would you call this a complicated case? Yes. And before you submitted your report, did you consult with that team that you've kind of described, other pathologists at the Office of the Medical Examiner? Yes. Do you have an opinion on how long after Victoria's death that this cutting, any of this cutting happened? I can't accurately say. Can you tell us the cause and manner of Victoria's death? Her cause was manual strangulation and the manner was homicide. May I have a moment, Erin? You may.
and to really get her arms and cut yes. her leg and cut her midline and take her organs out? Yes, this did not appear to be skilled at all. I'll pass it to Ms. Sherman. Thank you, Ross. Good morning, Dr. Ash. Good morning. I, I just have a few questions. Um, the body of a 10-year-old should have about two to 3,000 milliliters of blood. Is that true? Correct. And in this case, you couldn't even get four milliliters um, for your tube. Correct. Okay. When you went to the scene, the body parts were inside a bag that was inside another bag. Is that true? Correct. And um, the double bag was inside an orange laundry basket. Correct. Okay. And was one or both of them um, tied in a knot, if you remember? Both. Both of them. So the inside bag had a knot and then the outside bag had a knot. Correct. Did you happen to notice a blue and white purse that was on top of the body parts inside the outer bag, I guess it would be? Uh, the blue and white purse was on top of the bags. Okay, so the, um, we've got a bag and a bag and both of them and then the purse. Correct. All right, did you happen to notice a, a black sock there too? Or? I don't recollect. All right. Um, now, when you performed the, the autopsy, uh, you did not see any pink pajama bottoms, is that right? I, yeah, I, I would have to refer to what clothing was because it was multiple layers of clothing. Do you want to look? Yeah, do you mind? Yeah, please. Okay, and you answered my next question. She had a red shirt on her top. Correct. Now, Victoria had older bruises, like crusted scabs, like any active 10 year old. Would you agree? Yes. Was there any evidence through, uh, I think you did toxicology through tissues instead of the, the vial of blood, is that right? Correct. And what, was there any evidence that she had been drugged or had consumed alcohol or anything like that? So we discussed that and all before. It does not appear that way. No. Okay. Now you've mentioned some of this, but during the autopsy, you noticed a blunt injury on the top of her skull. Is that right? Right. So there was subscapular hemorrhage on the frontal and also on the occiput. Now could a, a steam iron be the object that caused such blunt injuries? Possible. All right. Now I think um, there were injuries to her face that's consistent with a hand or a pillow being pushed against her mouth. Do you agree with that? That would depend on the pillow. I, I have not seen pillows cause contusions, but the pillow compression from, could cause the abrasion. Okay. But unlikely a contusion. And that was between the, the, the teeth and the skin. Was it in the mouth that you saw injuries consistent with something being pushed against her mouth? Yes. All right. Now, the evidence that somebody grabbed her around the neck and choked her to death is quite strong in this case, isn't it? And it includes uh, hemorrhaging to the muscles in the back of the throat. Is that right? Correct. And by hemorrhage, we mean the heart is still beating at this point, and that's why 
um, why you, you saw bleeding back there. Correct. Um, boy, I don't know what this is. Posterior cricothyroid muscle, is that, I know where the thyroid is, so is it? Uh, so it's behind, actually. So your throat is a, a tube, and in the front is your thyroid, and then behind that you actually have tons of little muscles that help, when I speak, my vocal cords are moving, and you actually need several different muscles to elongate them, to stretch them, and these are some of the ones that are in the back that help you move air. This is a hard question for me, but did she suffer long? How, how long before she passed out? I don't know. Okay. Now, is it normal when someone is being choked to death that they empty their bowel and their bladder? Could that be something that happens when you're near death or? Yes, some, some do, some don't. Okay. Now, there are a number of post-mortem injuries. Um, you mentioned the, the broken arm, that occurred after death. Do you agree with that? Yes. And there were uh, injuries to, to the anal cavity as well that would be post-mortem. Do you agree? No, there was inflammation there. Okay. Now, uh, let's see. The, there were three separate stab wounds to the heart. Is that right? Uh, there were three sharp force injuries, yes. Now, those sharp force injuries, did they come from the outside of the body or after the heart was removed? I don't know. Okay. But somebody reached inside and pulled the heart out, didn't they? Yes. And someone purposefully cut through the liver to remove uh, one side of the liver. Yes. She was not breathing when someone set her body on fire. She was, uh, you would have seen evidence if she was still alive and breathing, right? Yes. And this, so this happened post-mortem. Yes. Now, the, the prosecutor asked you about, depending on the skill level, do you uh, agree with Dr. Kane that about an hour... Objection, Your Honor. You're saying... Um, really let, let me rephrase. You want to rephrase that? Yeah. Okay. Are, are you familiar... Uh, Dr. Kane was your supervising physician, yes. attending physician at the time, is that right? Correct. Can you give, I realize this is a ballpark because we don't know the skill level, but what amount of time would you put on uh, the amount of time a determined person would take to do all of this to the body? I don't know. I cannot accurately say for many of the reasons I already described. Do you disagree with his Objection. opinions?
about the length of time? Yeah. Did, did I send you an email with, with his opinion? You asked me if I agreed with an opinion in his deposition, and I said I had not reviewed it. And you still haven't reviewed it? No. Thank you. That's all I have. Oh, wait. I might have a question. Oh. That's all I have. Thank you. Read your Okay, for this to remain on live stream? Yes. Doctor, there was a question asked of you about some anal injuries to Victoria. Yes. Um, in the original autopsy, there was a finding of there being some injuries consistent with sexual assault. Yes. What is your understanding of those findings today? So, there are as I mentioned before, we have lots of different people who can ask for help, and there are other explanations for that possible uh, response. And specifically to her anal injury, you said there was inflammation. What does inflammation tell you about a tear or a injury to the anal area? It means it was before someone died. Uh, in this case, there was chronic inflammation identified. Um, I haven't reviewed the slides recently. I, what I wrote in my report, so this would have not been uh, immediately before death, likely. It would have been a period of time. Would it be consistent potentially with even something like constipation or something like that in yes. a 10 year old? Yes. May I have a moment, Your Honor? You, you may. Uh, vaginal injuries that were sort of also identified as potentially being consistent with a sexual assault? Yes. Was Dr. Shailen Nino also consulted in this case? Yes. Do you know what the opinion is of those um, injuries today? Uh, 
I have not read any official reports from her, but uh, from my experience, it may have been from other material. It does not have to be sexual assault. So there's no definitive evidence of a sexual assault? Correct. I think that's all the questions I have for Voidir. Just for now, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Aarons, do you have any questions? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. So are we going to go into this line of questions? I would like to ask those same questions before the jury, Your Honor. Any objections? No, Your Honor. Okay. Well, let's take about another 10 minutes or so break since we let the jury go, and we'll come back and continue with the examination of the doctor. <laughs>
but it felt great.
Um, yeah. There's three questions I neglected to ask, so I don't know. It might be most efficient if I've got a couple questions here. First, I wanted to show you exhibit R as a Romeo. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? That was Victoria's shirt. It was the red shirt you you saw her in at the scene and at autopsy? Yes. Okay. I'd move up R into evidence. No objection. R will be admitted. Second, uh, you mentioned there was some wetness on the fingers. I think you said they tucker up like if you're in the bathtub too long. <laughs> um, in this case, that came from it being inside that plastic bag. Is that right? Yes. So it wouldn't disturb any trace evidence that might be in there? It could. So if you have liquid, the blood, it will work just like any other liquid. So it could actually remove trace evidence. Okay. And then finally, you, you talked about these incisions that were used to remove the organs, right? Mm -hmm. Now that happened after death, didn't it? Correct. So if someone were to say they saw multiple downward thrusts, to her middle before or during her death that would, you didn't see anything like that did you so there is drying of the tissue in the central chest cavity if you remember kind of in the area of the sternum where i can't reapproximate any wounds so i cannot say if there were stab wounds in that area did you see any uh injuries beneath the the uh, the cavity um, consistent with, with stabbing to those organs? Uh, so there's the post-mortem wounds, but no pre-mortem wounds that would be consistent with that. Okay, so the as far as the evidence you have, um, you saw no such stab wounds before or during death? Correct. Thank you. That's all I have. Uh, some questions on cross about some anal tearing that we heard. Doctor, in the original autopsy report, um, there was a finding that those tears could have, could have been consistent with a sexual assault. Do you know the opinion on those tears today? So they could have been, but there are other explanations for those injuries as well. 
Is there any other information about those injuries that you're aware of today? Nothing specific. Can you tell us what inflammation is? So inflammation um, is your body's response to injury. So it's actually uh, tissue tear or if you get a scratch or anything. Um, I mentioned before that your neutrophils go rushing in and then your, uh, your, your lymphocytes, that's your chronic inflammation, they come next. So um, inflammation is just your body's response to something. Was there any inflammation found related to the anal injuries? In yes. The Was that um, chronic inflammation? Correct, yes, chronic. Could that also be consistent with something in a 10-year-old like constipation? Yes. And there were also some initial findings that there could be some vaginal injuries associated or that could be consistent with a sexual assault as well. Correct. Do you, uh, you mentioned in this case consulting with experts. Were other experts in this field consulted with in this case? Yes. Do you know if there is a different opinion or um, an additional opinion to those findings today? Yes. What is that opinion? Uh, it could be caused by other things. It's tender tissue, so it could be from a rub or something that was non-sexual. As far as the questions that you were just asked about stabbing, um, I think we agree that the injuries to the internal organs were post-mortem. Correct. So if there was stabbing, that would have been after death. And we can't say exactly what time death occurred, is that fair? Correct, yes. We have a moment, you may. and all these things that happened to Victoria um, that would have taken some amount of time. And if it's an inexperienced person and without a general amount of time or a specific amount of time, a longer amount of time than, say, you, who does this all the time. So would it be fair to say that Victoria had been dead for some period of time um, by the time that her arms and organs and everything were removed and bagged and put in that hamper and the carpet cleaned and all of that happened? Yes. Pass away, Mr. Thank you. May I speak to you? She may. All right, you may step down. Thank you. All right, next witness. Your Honor, the state will recall Detective Rich Lewis. Good morning, detectives. Good morning. We left off yesterday talking about some of the uh, DNA that was pertinent to your investigation found on Victoria's body. Moving to some of the physical items in the apartment, 
um, a huge number of items from the scene were assessed for either latent prints or for DNA, is that right? That is correct. Were some of those items associated specifically with the cleanup of the apartment? Yes, they were. What types of items were those, or what were those items? They were the uh, tr kitchen trash bags, uh, there was a mop, there was another trash bag that uh, the uh, Victoria's arms and the organs were found in. There was a hamper in the living room. Uh, there was some laundry. Uh, there were some books, at least one book that was in a, uh, what's what we're calling a wipes container, like a baby wipes uh, container. Those are the main things I remember. What about knives? Yes, my apologies, yes, two knives. Speaking about the wipes container, the knives, the trash bag at the bottom of the basket, um, the orange laundry basket, the unused one at the bottom, the trash bag containing her arms where the knot was, and some of the laundry specifically, the Tinkerbell comforter and the hand towel and the washer, did any of those items have something in common? Yes. What was that? It was male profile, DNA. Was Jessica Kelly found on any of those items? On just DNA or other late nip or other forensic items? On just those items. Was she found on any no. of those items? No. When Victoria was carried down the stairs in, uh, by Jessica Kelly, was there any sign or indication that her dismemberment and evisceration had already taken place? No, on the contrary. What would you have expected to see? With the injuries, uh, for the dismemberment, I would have expected to see, obviously, bloodletting. We should have seen a lot of blood on the stairs and the stoop. Um, I don't remember any witness describing Victoria as being, uh, pardon me, but armless at that point, dismembered at that point. Did some witnesses remember an arm? Exactly. Exactly, an arm flopping out. After she's carried down the stairs, which three people went into that apartment? Jessica Kelly. Fabian Gonzalez, the defendant, and Michelle Martins. Detective, you have reviewed the crime scene photos <clears throat> extensively. Do you have an opinion as to how long the cleanup, including wiping the body, wrapping the body, moving the body, doing laundry, cleaning the carpet in Victoria's room, putting her body parts into bags, cleaning the knives, uh, how long all that might have taken? I do. What is that? My training experience, uh, it would have taken hours. Does it seem likely to you, based on your review of this case, that there was some removal of items from this apartment? There had to have been. In general, when there is cleanup at a crime scene, like washing or um, moving things, wiping things, does that impact your ability as an investigator? Absolutely. How so? It destroys evidence. It moves things, it makes the scene more confusing for us. Uh, it just, it, it, it can destroy a case. Let's talk a little bit about, <coughs> excuse me, um, who we've been calling John Doe, or the fourth person in this case. We talked a little bit about sort of the first things you did, hearing the jail call between Jessica and her sister, and then also sort of reviewing lapels as one of the earlier things that you did. In your review of the lapels from the first responders, what types of things indicated that there could be a fourth person here? The main thing I remember from the lapels is the uh, three officers that confront Jessica Kelly after she uh, jumps off the back balcony. And then she makes some comments about a, another man being inside and how he was cleaning up blood he panicked and he left. And then she uh, told us who that was. Uh, and depending on who you talk to, it's narrowed down to either a Cote, Lakote. But I think uh, most now, after listening to it, uh, we believe she was saying Lakote. What does Lakote mean? Lakote is slang. Um, it's not a, a, an exact translation, but it's slang for crazy. Did you attempt to investigate who Lakote is? Extensively, yes. How did you do that? We queried 
not only uh, law enforcement databases for anybody who uses that moniker or nickname. We went to the county jail, New Mexico Corrections Department, uh, outside federal agencies looking for anything that would have matched this, of uh, this Locote. What's difficult about searching a name like Locote? A lot of times uh, we don't know their nicknames, so it doesn't make it onto a police report. Uh, a lot of times you don't use them. It could be somebody else pronounces it differently. Um, it's just it's just a nickname. It um, it's it's a needle in a haystack. Were there any other significant statements from those initial, um, not just the locales, but sort of the body worn cameras or recordings from the day of, specifically when Jessica was in the hospital? What I remember was was the the original investigators went to serve a search warrant to collect some standards from Jessica. And she started talking to them and she didn't understand why she was going to be arrested because she says there was four of us, something like that. I'm paraphrasing, there was four of us in the apartment. Was that also significant to you? To me it was, as soon as I heard it. You talked a little bit about reviewing jail calls. So Jessica Kelly was obviously arrested. Did you review the call to, or there's calls actually, to her mother that she made out of booking? Yes. And in those calls, do you believe she, uh, she says something like, Fabian brags too much about his brothers and he called on something. I thought he was a nobody, but he talks too much. What do you believe she's talking about? Objection, cause for speculation. Response? I'll rephrase. Sisting, did those statements uh, have an impact on your investigation? They were significant to me. Uh, what? It just. It tells me the defendant and the defendant's brothers are somehow involved in this. So in a jail call, um, sometimes people sort of use code or don't talk a lot because people understand they're being recorded. What was Jessica's demeanor like in those calls? I don't know how, just almost excited and trying to tell her mother some things and almost upset. She was, she was very loud on several jail calls. Does she sound like she's potentially even crying? She's upset in a lot of jail calls. She's very upset. She's crying in a lot of the jail calls we listen to. You also made some recordings of Jessica Kelly inside the jail. Now, in contrast to a jail phone call, do inmates typically expect to be recorded inside the facility? They do not. Is that a common thing that's done? In my experience, I've used that before, yes. How common is it used, as far as you know, at this facility? I don't know how often it's done by other officers. I've used two or three times. In your 40 years? Uh, at this facility. I've, we've used it at other facilities, um, both New Mexico Corrections, other jails across the country, and at our local jail. Do inmates typically expect that you'd be recording them? No. Why did you decide to record her? I felt that in conjunction with uh, a news release that it would be an opportunity to have her speak. Uh, I knew at that time that she was speaking openly about many things to her fellow inmates. Uh, I, I felt that uh, she wanted to talk about this incident, this murder, and I felt it was a good opportunity. Uh, she would have no idea that I was there and I was recording and I thought the statements that she would make would be open and honest. And what were the dates of those statements, of those recordings, I'm sorry? June of 2018, I think maybe a week or two later. Without refreshing my memory, I can't give you the exact dates. Do, does June 19th of 2018 and July 2nd of 2018 sound right? Yes, that does sound correct. While you were recording her, what was happening inside the facility? What was she observing? What was she seeing? So that, that particular pod that she was in is a segregation pod. So every uh, inmate is locked into their cell. One can come out at a time. There is a day area with a television set. Um, so uh, she, around noon, I believe, noon news, she was watching uh, a press conference with the district attorney's office. Related to this case? Yes. And the jury has heard some of those recordings, and there's one about 
now she's able to tell her family. How did you, what, did, what was her demeanor during that statement? I took it as relief. She, she, I believe it was, and I'm paraphrasing without looking at the transcript, it was she was telling this other inmate outside of her cell uh, that she could finally tell her family that uh, there was another man there. And it almost seemed like relief to me. Detective, are you familiar with Jessica Kelly's voice? Yes. Are you familiar with her sister Crystal Kelly's voice? Yes. Have you spoken to both of them personally? Yes. Have you listened to jail calls with both of their voices on the jail call? Yes.
earlier with you having, um, you being familiar with Crystal Kelly and Jessica Kelly's voices. Are you also familiar with Lori Collins' voice? Not as familiar, but I've recognized it. Have you spoken to her? Yes, I have in have person. Have you calls with her on there? Yes, I have. Detective, were you ever able to identify the specific mail that came over to Harmon 808 on October 23rd, 2016? No. Did any neighbors see someone go into apartment 808? Not to my knowledge. Did that change your opinion, the fact that no neighbor saw of the, whether or not this person exists? No. Why not? Neighbors missed a lot of things that were going on during that time period. Uh, and it's not uncommon in a large complex like that to miss things like that. You're going to be inside your house, you're going to be asleep, you're going to be doing things, watching TV. So no, it doesn't really change my opinion at all. Did any neighbor see the defendant fixing his car the morning of the murder? No, that's just one example. They didn't see or remember Martin Martinez coming over on his Harley motorcycle. Detective, have you ever considered that this entire crime could be just Jessica Kelly? Of course. And how does that play into your opinion that there's a fourth person? How are you, how do you reconcile those, that, that consideration? I, I can't. I'd have to be blind to all the physical evidence. I'd have to be blind to things that were said by Jessica Kelly, uh, specifically in a panic right after jumping out of a, of a window, making those statements, or off a patio, I mean. And then she had no idea I was recording her conversation with an inmate. So I'd have to ignore, you just have to be blind to all the evidence and essentially just ignore it. In your experience, are people typically more forthcoming talking to their friends or talking to police? No friends. Have you been able to rule out any particular theory or person uh, who might have murdered Victoria? I know that uh, Michelle Martins and the defendant were not there between 7.05 and 8.48 on the day in question. But other than that, uh, I know I wasn't there. Other than that, um, it's still an open investigation. What are the two things that have made this investigation extremely difficult for you? How everyone is hesitant to talk to us. Um, people in this investigation have minimized their involvement. Uh, people want to stay out of it, whether they're witnesses or suspects or family members. But I think the main thing was the tampering of the scene, the scene cleanup. Uh, that has completely scuttled the entire investigation. What about time? Is, is time a factor? Time's always a factor. Time's always a factor. And uh, the, the longer this goes on, the more we lose witnesses, uh, potential evidence. Um, time's always a factor in these investigations. There's been a lot of criticism about this investigation. Do you find that criticism to be fair? I think honest, constructive criticism and critique and peer review of cases is very fair, and we have to do that. Uh, as long as it's just not name calling and things like that, but uh, I welcome peer review. I welcome outside views. I want people to look at my work and look at, I take everyone's view very seriously and listen to what they tell me. So I think it's fair.
been marked for identification as States Exhibit 200. We can play you a portion of this call and see if you're able to identify the voices on it. You said 200? I'm sorry, 300. 400. 400. I'm a little behind, so let me remark this. Does we waive any foundational issues if they want to just play it? All right, so 400 will be admitted and you may go ahead and publish. Thank you. I'm going to play this call. I have um, what's now been admitted to states 400. Is it, do we have it? This is a call between Jessica and her sister from February 1st of 2017. Do you know when the bulk of the DNA started coming back in this case? Well, after that, in the t late 2017, I didn't come on board till August, July, August 2017, so most of the bulk was well after that. Her mother was the first one with the deeper, uh, raspy voice. And she's talking about Sinner and how someone was messing with her. Did Jessica Kelly tell you 
um, at any point in the investigation that the defendant was messing with her in relation to saying that he was meeting up with Sinner? And you could, uh, yes, and you could also hear that on the, the phone call the night of the murder. Crystal was, was harassing her sister, Jessica. And she mentioned something about an intervention. She thought there was going to be an intervention. Is that consistent with her statements that you've heard in this case? Yes, it is. Yes, she was. Yeah. It's going to be good. You're going to have days. It's going to be fine. Like, 
I know. I know it. It's like, I know. It's like, I know. It's like, I went through it too. Like, I fucking collapsed, dude. I collapsed. And I just started screaming. I said, it's a mistake. It's not mine. It's not my sister. You know what I mean? I said, I just talked to her. It can't be her. It's like, it's not my sister. Why are you still talking about me? Why are you still talking about me? Why are you still talking about me? Why are you still talking about She had just talked to her mom at 10 o'clock that night. Is that consistent with the call you saw on the phone records between Jessica Kelly and her mom, Lori, the evening um, of the 23rd? It is. And also, were there calls to Nia and to Roxy or Roxanne Portable? Yes. prison. Uh, she was dating Peewee. Pee -wee. She went up on the door and I opened it. And she said, oh, where's Peewee? Like, this look on her face said it all, you know what I mean? And I said, oh, he's sleeping. Can you wake him up? I said, probably not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 testified to this, but Jessica just said she kicked it with Martine for a night. Is that consistent with their meeting up and him going to Harmony Way? Yes. Uh, after the barbecue, when her half-brother William Hollis dropped her off at Martine's on his Fayho. And did he at one night um, end up at 808, Martine Martinez? Yes. That was before the barbecue had been that Friday into Saturday morning. Hey, I was doing good, yes. I was doing good. They, they 
should be this spring here, and then um, they put Shayla up there, Roberta's niece. Yeah. Oh, did you hear about my mom, Roberta? Yeah. That's crazy, huh? Yeah. Was that done yet? No, not yet. Um, hope. Uh huh? Your life, your kids, bro. I'm so fucking tired. I don't give a fucking 
I don't know the exact date, but I know she took a plea in this case. Do you know that she knew or if she knew about the fourth person before she took her plea? I don't know. I don't think so. Are you sure? Was the D when did the DNA come out indicating there was a fourth person? Can I see that? I, could I refresh my memory on the date that she actually pled guilty? I'm confused on that. Yes. Let me show you states 371. Did she know that there was a fourth suspect at the time she took Yes, it? it was well after that it had come out. Not well after, but it was after it came out. And you've had the opportunity to interview Ms. Kelly twice. Yes. And you've also studied the defendant's initial police interview. Yes, ma'am. Is it surprising to you in any way that they point fingers at one another? No, that's very common. In the defendant's interview, um, we've heard from Detective Brown, Sergeant Brown, um, and we've seen some clips and heard testimony that he kind of skips over some critical points in the night after 848 when he goes into the apartment with Michelle and Jessica after Victoria's dead. Is it your opinion that that's when the majority of the cleanup happened in this case? Yes, it is. Who passed the witness room? We will take a break for lunch and we'll come back at, let me ask you for time and purposes, let me have the price first. Thank you. 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 Thank you.